Um, my name's Claire McCrory and I'm, um, I work for Fruit Growers Taz and we have the pleasure of um, having our, our guest here from the Netherlands. Um, his name is Klaas Plaas and he's an expert in strawberries. And today he'll be presenting on two topics and we also have a, um, a segment uh, available for questions after each topic. But also if you have any burning questions that uh, uh, you think of after the presentation, please send them through to Michael, uh, his emails in the, um, the webinar uh, link. Um, so I'll just give a, an introduction of class. Um, he's a Dutch specialist in strawberries with a Bachelor of Agricultural Science and he's been working in the field for more than 30 years. Uh, he started his career as a consultant with the Dutch Ministry of Agriculture as a specialist for vegetables and strawberries. And after eight years of work there, he moved with his family to Romania and then to Ukraine for eight and a half years of agricultural development work for an aid organization. He combined this role with private consulting for strawberry growers. In 2007, he and his family moved back to the Netherlands and continued to work for DLV plant, now called Delphi, as a specialist in strawberries across Central and Eastern Europe, Germany and the Netherlands. In 2010, Klaas started his own company, Berry Consult, and he's been consulting to growers in countries across Western, Central and Eastern Europe, the Netherlands, Germany, Poland, Czech Republic, Slovakia, Slovenia, Hungary, Romania and Ukraine, and even to some growers further afield here in Australia and also Canada. Terrific. And if you'd like to join me in welcoming Klaas Plas to the microphone. Well, thank you very much. It's a little bit far away from home. And to be honest, I'm a little bit nervous. This is the first time I'm doing this, uh, this way of presentation. Um, strawberries, yeah, 30, 32 years in it. Uh, we just discussed yesterday. I, I didn't have it in my mind, but it's still a, a lovely job. I, I think. Uh, Every day I'm learning. If I'm visiting growers, not a day I, I end learning. And that's what, what makes it uh, also very, very nice to me. Always something new, something, some new development. And if you look at the strawberries in nowadays world, um, all over the world, strawberry growing is, is, is in. But we will come back on that on the, on the next presentation or so. But first, uh, something about strawberry imbalance i i uh, call the presentation but it's going about uh, plant architecture um, in combination with how to deal with plants uh, a strawberry is quite uh, quite hard to 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 grow it has a lot of possibilities and I, we will focus on that if uh, there are questions here inside, please ask. I think that's the easiest way. We have enough time, I understood, so uh, ask the questions and I can, can come back on that immediately. But I suppose that uh, also the people from further away might have uh, the same questions. Uh. Generative and vegetative. Um, on the left, you see uh, a strawberry. The, the, the plants are of about the same age, I suppose. And the uh, left, you see strawberry plants here with quite a number of trusses. You can see here one, two, they're on back three, and I think there's a fourth one. So four trusses. Leaf area is not that big. Here on the right hand, you see a strawberry. I saw somewhere yeah, here on the background, you see a flower, but it's mainly leaves in here. And it's what we call a generative and vegetative strawberries. Here a generative one, a lot of flowers. Here a vegetative, and a lot of leaves. With nowadays varieties, it's a little bit more easier, I think, but in the past we had varieties that if they went to a generative direction, they had a lot of flowers, then it was quite a problem to get them so far that they started with leaf growing again. And with uh, the other way around, if a crop was very vegetative, it might, might be so that over a, for a month of time you couldn't pick strawberries or hardly pick strawberries. So that's quite a loss in both cases. In a, in a generative one you will have small strawberries, no taste. Um, in, the, in the vegetative one, no, no yield. So it's, it's quite, quite, uh, quite a loss. Oh yeah, here we see it again. Uh, generative, a lot of flowers, few leaves. 
Normally, the first flush is very high, what you also can see here in, uh, in there are four trusses coming out, so you can expect in, in a couple of weeks, about six weeks, you can expect quite a, a large first flush. Um, but afterwards, the yield drops down quite fast because all the energy the plant has uh, from, from the few leaves has gone into the strawberry development, new flowers that were inside abort, and they, uh, the new flowers just don't come. Bad taste and small fruits, like just mentioned. Here again, the vegetative. You see very few flowers, high leaf area index. Uh, leaf area index is a known uh, term, I suppose. That means uh, leaf area, that's easiest. First flush, low. Second flush, coming soon, we hope, if it's not too vegetative. A very good taste and large berries. Now, and here we will see two um, yield developments. Here you see, for example, one, this is a glasshouse crop. And uh, it will start at the ending of April, week 17. That's about the end of April. You can see it going high, going down over a long period. And the next one, this is a, a spring crop in uh, tunnels. Here you see it going up and then going down and up and down and up and down and then stabilize. Now, that is what, not what we would like to. Normally, we, um, it depends a little bit on, on, on what is the goal of the, of the grower. There are growers, for example, that have a June bearer, start with a June bearer, I've also heard it here in Tasmania, start with a June bearer and afterwards they want to have a stable production from their ever bearers. In case you have a June bearer, then you would like to have a peak at the spring and that goes down and then the second planting for the ever bearers, for example, goes up and stays stable on this level about. In case you, there are also growers that say from look here, I only want to do this with my everbeer, so I want to have a plant with the flowers already inside that goes up this way, goes down a little bit, and if possible stabilize. Now it always goes down more and then it should stabilize, for example. That's also, that might be a, a production goal for, for strawberries. Um, but in both cases, it's very important to know what's in the plant. And that's the interesting, I think, also uh, for uh, strawberries related to, for example, a tomato crop. I always see it. I'm, I'm not a tomato specialist. I've, I've, we, have done, we have grown some tomatoes as we were in Ukraine and Romania, also varieties to show to people and show new growth techniques. But in case you have a, straw, a, a tomato seed, they're hybrids, so they're identically almost. And nowadays nurseries are so modern, so they grow up almost the same. So that means against the time that the tomatoes are uh, planted, they are my, almost the same. Um, with strawberries, it's different. You can have um, what I just mentioned, the vegetative plants and the generative plants, but there are all kinds of stages in between. And this influences also this, uh, the, 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 the whole um, cycle of, of the, the, the production over time. Um, here we see it a little bit more. Here, this is, an, uh, this is a February planting of a, a rooted plant. Now, this shouldn't be there, this picture. But, so take it. And it starts about flowering. This is in a glasshouse crop. It starts flowering in April, for example. Now, uh, uh, the picture is not quite well. It should be there. I only see it by now, unfortunately. <laughs> um, so it starts flowering uh, later, and then uh, June, May, June, July, August, September, you can uh, have strawberries from it. In case you plant it later, you will also have, for example, you have first an, a June bearer uh, before it. You plant this one, you will have uh, a shorter season with your ever bearers. There's also another option that you plant a tray plant, for example, with already a number of flowers inside, and then you see that your production is coming much earlier. So that is what we see like here, a, li a little bit like the second graphic that we saw, that uh, the first flush is quite high. So then you have a quite early production, it goes down again, and then you have some flowering, and then it goes again into, uh, in, in, into the harvest like here, for example. 
Now, what's what's the information behind it and why does this, this happen? I will first show you a little bit on, on the, the plant architecture in a in June bearer. It's a little bit easier. Here you see a schedule, but first on this one. In um, the interesting with the strawberries is in case you have a June bearer already in the late autumn, um, in our country it's in December. Uh, here I don't know when it will fall, just short. Uh, late autumn, that's surely before winter starts, so May. Okay, in uh, May, then um, we can uh, take out a plant of the uh, of the soil and just take out the leaves, peel off the leaves. Ah, I've, I've here you just brought in someone brought in here some plants. I could could show it later on, but you peel off the leaves, and then in that um, in that how do you call it in the place between the main uh, rhizome and and the leaf. Uh, I don't remember it. There you you can you can find a flower bud. And the size of these flower buds differ, like you can see here very much. So this is the main first flower bud on the top, and then from this flower bud is here down here. The second is here, uh, here coming. The third and so on, it's going up then. And what you can see here, this one might be about 10 millimeters, so that's a, that's a nice truss. And the second flower bud, this one is also quite nice. And therefore we have developed a different uh, of a, 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 a scientist if I've, I'm well from Italy has the science has, has uh, skilled this I will show you immediately a picture of, uh, of, of this and um, in this way you can estimate how many flower trusses you can harvest from this plant so in this case this is too small this is too small and this is too small so one two, three, four, five, five flower trusses you can harvest under normal circumstances from this, uh, this, this, this is a clary. Um, and that means about 500 grams. So I calculate for this, uh, this, those growers with 100 gram of plant. Now what happens in case the circumstances are very bad, so this is a little bit of smaller flower truss, in case th there is not enough energy for this plant, because it's all about energy, it has to develop further. And in case there's not enough energy, for example, uh, temperatures are high in the spring and it's very cloudy, so you have um, low radiations with high temperatures, so the energy demand in the plant, I will come back on that later also, but the energy demand in the plant is very high and uh, because of, of cloudy circumstances he doesn't get enough energy, then you will see that there's a competition between these flower buds and the smallest flower buds just remain inside, don't develop. And that's, this one would remain inside. Or what's also possible, for example, in case you have flower buds in the same level, let's say there are uh, a lot of flower buds in level five. So at that time, the fruit load will be very high that the flower buds that are in development at that time stay back, don't develop. That's also something we'll come back on it uh, later a little bit. Now for here you see, for example, the first is a seven. And then uh, from the top up, or a, a four, a three, a four, a three. Generally, if it's below three, we say it won't develop. And the three is also an item uh, of, of, of climate and, and energy in the plant. In case low energy, a three won't develop either. So in case there's too much competition between flower buds, the three don't develop. And in case there is enough energy in a plant, sometimes happens that a two or 2.5 also develop before, for example, in case it's very cold outside and we have blue skies all the spring, that there is enough energy in the plant, then it may also develop. It may be interesting to know with um, some varieties, you can see that if you cut them back after the harvest, that those small buds get again energy and develop and then you have a second flush in a June bearer. So not an everberry, a second flush in a June bearer. And there are varieties that are more uh, sensitive for it as other varieties. For example, the clary is known known to do those things. And at the beginning, they said, "Hey, it's it's half, it's half, half an everberry." No, it's it's not half half an everberry. It's only those those dormant buds that after they 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 got enough energy started to develop again and uh, started flowering. Is it all clear? Uh,
Yeah, what you see, um, I just made a simple drawing of a strawberry plant. And normally, in case now here, this is uh, already in harvest, so just count count on that this flower flower truss is not in there. Um, normally, in, in in the autumn, in the late autumn, in, in May here, if I take off this leaf, for example, take it down, there is a flower bud. Take. I take off this leaf first, then there is also a flower bud, there's a flower bud, there's a flower bud, there's a flower bud. Or uh, the, it starts always with a, with a runner. What we see that uh, in case the day length is um, more than 13 uh, hours, then uh, the plant, uh, a June bearer at least, will develop runners, depending a little bit on the growing symptoms. So that's a general rule. More than 13 hours of day length, then it will develop a runner less as uh, 13 hours of day length, then it will develop a flower truss. And what we then uh, also see, um, we will t later talk also a little bit about vegetative and generative circumstances. Uh, with vegetative and generative circumstances, we can uh, get it earlier or later. So in case of generative circumstances, that means stress for a plant, this flower induction may be uh, two to four weeks earlier. In vegetative circumstances, this flower induction may also delay uh, four weeks. I've seen it, for example, in growers with um, who, who had a variety June bearer, very normal, good irrigation, a lot of fertilizer, uh, nitrogen, and then they started not at middle of September, what's normal for us, the, 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 the line for 13 hours, but it started middle of October. And itself, it sounds not, 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 not a big problem, but the problem is afterwards. You only have from the middle of October till winter is quite short, especially in, in heat hours. Uh, from middle of September till the winter is much longer, so that means a quite a big loss of uh, strawberries of yield. But the main, what I would like, wanted to say is, in case you peel them off, the flower buds are in here. It's or a flower bud or a, a runner, and you can see a difference between a runner and a flower bud quite easy. If you take apart some plants, and then you will see that the, the, the runner is always a little bit longer. It's smaller and longer, whereas a flower bud is a little bit shorter and wider. But you, you will see it in case you just have to do it, take some time, uh, take apart some, some plants at a time, and then you'll see it. And here we see the pictures, is this from several Scientists. Here you see the pictures and uh, the scaling also from, from those flowers. You have seen the number seven, for example, just before. There's this one, it was on the top flower. It is at that time in this size. This is a one. Now you see only a first, a very first um, flower induction. Second, a third, a fourth, you see coming high. Now you see already very nice. The, the, the flower yesterday, uh, I mean, day before yesterday, we were on a, with a grower and also they had a microscope. We took apart a plant and you could see about this stage of the plant. I think it was a little bit between those two. This stage of the plant, you could take out the flower with a microscope and a scalpel, or you call it a very sharp knife. And going here, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11. It's just a system to, to uh, show the stages and it makes it much easier to understand uh, the, the plant uh, architecture. If you, you are interested in it, take apart plants, take time, just invest a few hours and then you will see how it looks like. Problem always is uh, in this stage also, for example, there were a lot of hairs on the, on, on the bud, so you have to remove the hairs and then only afterwards you will see the, 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 the flower. Now this is from um, Plantologica, he is, is, is a man from uh, University of Wageningen. Um, he, he is working for the university and also connected to it. He has his own uh, company uh, directly related to the university and he's doing flower mapping in the Netherlands for a lot of growers, I understood from all over the world almost. And here you see then um, um, date, grower, what is it, no, Favori Mini Tray, this is a uh, uh, breeding company in the Netherlands for 40 mini tray, plant number, crown number. Now you can have more crowns on a, on a, on an ever this is an ever bearer. You can have more crowns on, a, on an ever bearer. You can have one, two, three. Uh, it's just here. Oh, here you see also one, two, three crowns. Now and then the position. 
And here you see the development stage and the size of the truss. Now with this information, if I gather all this information from this plant, I see how many flowers are there inside. I see how many flowers in which stage. And it says already a little bit on, on what I can expect. Have a look on this one. Here I split it out a little bit. I think it's a little bit easier to see. This is the main crown. This has an eight. It here has a side crown. This has a nine on top and a three there, six there. You have here the second crown, a six, and then it's going on. And this is a quite, quite standard structure for an ever bearer. And here you can see eight, nine, seven, six. So quite some flowers on top there and also quite some flowers coming about at the same time. So here you, you could say that uh, the, the second graphic I've shown about the first peak production uh, and afterwards what, what goes down, it, it almost corresponds with, uh, with such, a, such a planned schedule, sp uh, planned, uh, planned architecture. You can have this one also, for example. And here you see it's, it's just the same picture as before, but here I've cut off those parts on uh, the were extra. Here you only have three crowns, a nine, an eight, and a six, and a few after coming afterwards. So this will start up much easier, much slower. They won't have uh, that high first flush. But in case we have um, a frigo plant, for example, a small frigo with, uh, let's say, about 800 in a box, so that's, that's what size does it have? I think it's about 10, 10, 12 millimeters or something like that. You may, ha you may have only this main part, so it will start with one, maybe two flower trusses, and afterwards it, it develops. That's clear? Yeah, just some points to... Look back, June bearer starts flower induction from less than 13 hours daylight. An ever bearer, uh, the vegetative state is a status in which the plant develops a lot of leaves, and generative, in which the plant is, develops a lot of flowers. And then energy balance, balance is a second point that uh, will come a little bit later afterwards also. Now, top, this, this has to do also with uh, top sprout dominance or apical dominance. I'm, not so good in my pronunciation, but I think you will understand. Uh, vegetative, gen generative vegetative again. And now um, I just mentioned that um, it, it really matters uh, what type of plant you have. In case we have the plant from, I can, can I go back easy? Yeah, I can show this one. In case I have this plant, for example, I already mentioned that it will have a very a uh, high first flush and after, afterwards it drops back, but you will have small strawberries. That's not what I want to. But there are systems you can uh, man manipulate the strawberry on a certain level. It's also done in this, this is also used in the, in, in the tomato uh, production. Vegetative and generative. My first thing is although in green are the, 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 the subjects I normally use. Um, the first point I always use in case I see a plant with, uh, that is very generative, so with a lot of flowers coming, I start with high nitrogen, high ammonia. So I give it, for example, 1.5 millimoles per liter ammonia, and the nitrogen go up to 30 millimoles per liter about. And with this uh, high nitrogen and high ammonia, we give the plant a, a vegetative boost. So it will, uh, we try to stimulate it maximum to, to give a, a greater leaf area more energy, uh, so, it, so so the flowers will have the possibility, the, the uh, strawberries will have the possibility to develop, and later on also flowers may come back earlier. But also drip pH, if we go down with the, the drip pH to 4.8 till 5.3, and I think that's for tomato growers sounds quite low, but a strawberry can handle quite low uh, pH, then we also see an extra uh, stimulants in, in uh, vegetative development. EC substrate a little lower, drip EC a little bit lower, substrate moisture, ooh, I still have it here. This is wrong. A little bit wetter and here generative is a little bit lower, so sh this should be the other way around. I also had a mistake in the conference. Irrigation, shorter but more frequently, so that means that the substrate in general is a little bit more moisture. And drip frequency, uh, ofter. Uh, that's what I just said, it's shorter and after. 
Now, a runner picking often, so don't go within there. Then, then you have a vegetative action. So that means in case I have a lot of flowers, I have to take a vegetative action in this direction. In the other way, if I have a lot of leaves, um, go down with your nitrogen, your ammonia, pH to normal, EC higher, drip EC higher, substrate moisture that's then the drier, irrigation longer and less frequency. And we also do it this way that uh, in very extreme circumstances we see that there are no flowers coming at all or, or very slowly, um, don't give them water for two, three days. You won't do that during the harvest because it, it will influence your uh, fruit quali quality uh, quite strong. So that's not a good uh, thing, but in case you, are, you don't have uh, strawberries on your crop, you can do it. And you will see your leaves going down a little bit, afterwards uh, rehydrated, and you will see that uh, with this stress, it's a stimulation for a new flower development. Doesn't sound nice. It isn't nice at all, but uh, it's not only about being nice to the strawberries, you want to have production also. And um, uh, another item is, you can do it with coir, but with, uh, with normal peat soil, for example, it's quite hard, because uh, coir is quite easy to rehydrate, uh, peat is, is, is another item, it's, it's quite hard to rehydrate it, therefore you need to, uh, I wouldn't directly advise to you to do it with that. But coir is like a sponge in case you drop it in the center, it, it goes out to, to also the, the, the sides of, the, of, of, the, of the, the bag. Any questions about this? Nothing? Or is it just boring? Uh, <laughs> okay. Now, um, just to come back on energy, um, I also mentioned uh, energy is, is essential. That's the other part in, in uh, what's going on in the plant. What we do see, uh, yeah, we talked at the beginning about the small buds with the June bearer, for example. Now we see a kind of same, same system with the ever bearers. Um, this is a, a very general, I think it's from, from tomatoes. This is a very, very general graphic. Here we see down the temperature, here a uh, level of uh, energy uh, produced or, or used by the plant. Here we see in case temperature goes up, then a higher uh, photosynthesis level, so more assimilates in the plant. So energy, available energy, I would like to say. This one is the uh, use of, uh, of energy in the plant. Uh, it stands there also, photosynthesis in, used in respiration. So in, uh, temperature goes up, and they cross here, and somewhere around here, you're on the zero level because the production of energy and the consumption of energy of the use of energy is about the same. Now for tomatoes they have here the 96, if I remember that's about 35 or 33 degrees. With strawberries we know it's about 30 degrees, then we are on zero. Now what will happen in the plant with those small buds, if you are about June berries and we are on this level, and that may be because this graphic is this way, but in case we have a lot of uh, strawberries uh, on, on, on the plant, for example, this, this whole line may go in that direction. Uh, the level of uh, energy used is much or in that direction, and the level of energy uh, to be used is much higher because there's also a demand of energy for the production of the strawberries, all the sugar in the strawberries, and so on. And then you'll see that um, there is less energy left and in that case, the twos, I just mentioned that the, 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 the flower buds in uh, development stage two, for example, they won't develop at all. But with everberries, we see the same, that there are some small flower buds inside, but in case the temperatures go up very high and we have high production, that those small flower buds we cannot see with our eyes, but with a microscope we might see, they just abort. It's a little bit the same what we see with cucumbers, for example, and then we can see it in case you have cucumbers and temperatures goes how high and there is quite some production on a cucumber that the flowers or uh, they just fall out. A small, small quick cucumbers that seems to be there of a centimeter get yellow and drop down. That's what we see also with the uh, everbearers. For a couple of years ago, an Italian professor has focused on it and he found out that they were there but were aborted. A little bit water <laughs> running dry.
Now, if you know your plant, um, you can anticipate on it. So more or less nitrogen, more or no ammonia, drip EC, pH, temperature, moisture and irrigation schedule. That's an important item. Now I go back a little bit because there's more to tell about it. Previous. Um, what what, I, what we also uh, what I also mentioned is uh, depending on the type of the plant, you can also uh, kind of plan your 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 production. In case you have a plant with a lot of flower trusses inside, like I've shown before, you will have a high first flush. In case you have a very few flower trusses inside, like a standard frigo plant, for example, or a small frigo plant, you may have a very small first flush, but a quite stable production. But there are also, the, the tray plant is quite a big one with 200 milliliters. You also have a smaller a plug plant, for example, with, I don't know why, I think it's about 50, 60 milliliters. And generally, this has uh, less flower trusses inside. So there are several plants on the market normally that you can use for your production and you can also try to fit them in, in the system you have on your own company. Do you have, first have a June bearer? Then you may want to plant this frigo plant, for example, and start up already early so that against that the June berry goes down, that the um, frigo ever bearer is already slowly in production. In case you want to do it all with your ever bearer, you, you may need one with four or five flower trusses in there. So you have a very fir, fir, high first flush, it goes down, and therefore you have to find a solution. And then it stabilizes if everything goes well. In case you don't want to have a very high first flush, but a bit, little bit lower, so it doesn't go down totally, you may uh, want to work with a, a plug plant, for example. Um, questions? Yes. Yeah, that, that's an interesting one, and um, it's also uh, yeah, new, not new. It's quite logical. Um, uh, we are discussing at this moment, or l for last week I was with German grower, and they had uh, tunnels, tabletops inside. They have grass below the, uh, below the tabletops. And they use this grass and the, the evaporation of this grass to cool down the temperature in the tunnels. And he said, and they have data loggers, so it's, it's quite exact, he said they were able to cool down the temperature in the tunnels with about 6 degrees. So that's quite a lot. And quite essentially also, in case you see the graphic, you can, for example, even in case the temperature in the, with the strawberry is about 33 degrees and you can cool it down to uh, 27, that makes sense. That makes sense in, in case of energy and also uh, flower development, flower, flower quality and so on. That, that's quite a lot. So you can use uh, moisture and, and, uh, for, for cooling down. We also have systems in the Netherlands with high, high pressure, what did I do? Uh, high pressure uh, uh, misting. Um, they do use it, but I have to be honest, I'm not very satisfied until now. It does work, but it also makes the plan a kind of lazy. We have seen, for example, in case you're not totally op using it optimum, then um, the number of, I think it works that way, that the number of stomata end up in the leaves is growing. And in case you, you, you have a little bit of problem with, not, uh, with, with, not the hum uh, with the not optimum humidity of the plant, then it will have a lack of humidity. It cannot react that fast. And then you see very easily a, a lot of mildew coming into the, in, into the crop. So that's, that's very hard to, to do that in a good way. I didn't hear. Are there issues with, at those high temperatures? Yeah. Introducing mist to try and drop the air temperature. But the, the, the atmosphere, does the atmosphere become saturated in terms of humidity? And are there solutions out there where they're moving in drier air? And so the question is, um, with these high temperatures, in case we use misting, uh, are the, is it possible that the, 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 the um, Humidity becomes 100% too high. 
Yes, that's possible. But but normally, in case you have a misting system that's a quite expensive system, you also have a, a computer to to uh, that that will regulate the, the moisture. So normally, we use the misting based on 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 the humidity in the in the glass house crop, and that's or in relative in percentages or in VPD. And then you can also uh, arrange how many percent, how many minutes or seconds it goes, for example, how frequently, and so on. So it's quite quite well possible to to do. But but still, I, I've seen growers where they used it, and the mildew was was quite quite a quite a problem, quite an quite an item. Yeah, dry air, it's a matter of uh, window opening, uh, open less or, or open, uh, open the windows based on, on the humidity inside. And vents we also use, uh, depending on, on how big the glass house is, for example, vents for moving air uh, in a vertical direction, up and down, to have a quite stable climate in, in, in the glass houses. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's quite frequent, frequently done, and, and to be honest, uh, in, in, as, as, as uh, growers uh, ask for, for from from nurseries, they want to buy plant material. For example, I always ask for always ask for for the uh, schedule of the plant from the plant architecture, like it just shown in that table. Always, because you want to know what you have in case a, a grower is. Is, is growing, it become, becomes, gets a plant, for example, with six, seven flowers, or three flowers, or ten flower, flower trusses, sorry, inside. It really matters how we start. In case they have a little bit high number of flower trusses inside, let's say a June bearer with eight flower trusses inside, we really have to start vegetative. In case the, the, the you have a plant with only four, uh, you need to be, take, be careful, because in case you start too vegetative, then the flower, uh, fl the leaves will develop much more, and then it's going about this uh, apical dominance that uh, that you may lose one trust, for example. But also, um, in case you want to know how many uh, plants you plant per uh, a linear meter, it's quite important to know the, the goal, depending on the growing uh, way of growing, is about uh, 500 till 800 flowers per meter. So it matters quite a lot if you have three trusses, let's say 30 flowers in a plant, or you have 60 or 80 flowers in a plant. And based on that, we may we decide uh, how many plants need to, need to be planted per linear meter, and how we are, how we are going to start with uh, fertilization and with, with uh, growing conditions. So it's, for me, it's, at this moment, it's just a basic item in advising growers in, in how to start up. I wouldn't do without uh, by now. It's how many years do we do it? I think uh, about five, maybe more years. We're working now more, maybe already 10 years. We're working with that quite generally, but not without it. It's such a good option, such a good possibility. But also for a nursery, you, want, you would like to know that everything that what you have done, what, what reaction it gave, how many flower trusses do you have inside? How many um, crowns do you have? Why do you have so many crowns? And your your growers also want to have a certain plant, so you, you you can adapt to the need of the growers. It's it's, I think nowadays in Western Europe quite basic system. Yes. feeling, but I don't have hard other information about it. I have the feeling that is more on uh, the, 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 the balance that is already in the plant, so vegetative or generative. 
There is another thing that is, uh, might be quite important in this, is the, the priority of, um, uh, how do you call it, division of energy in the plant. What I see that the first priority is always uh, flowers and uh, strawberries. Second priority is uh, the uh, leaves and so on. And uh, third priority is roots. And that's interesting because uh, during peak harvest, you see a lot of growers very worried about the roots in case they're cutting at least. It's very good that they cut open their, their uh, bags, their um, uh, they're growing on, they just have a look on the roots and they're worried about the roots because they're getting yellowish and they're getting brown and I have a problem, I've made a mistake. No, in most cases, I, I, you need to check whether it's correct or not, but in, in a lot of cases, in case of peak production, if you, are high, you have high temperature, the plant doesn't have enough energy to keep the roots developing and that's why they get yellow and red. Did that answer your um, yeah. No, no. Yeah, so how is the plant decision on these normal conditions in, in, in this energy thing? I don't know, I don't know. I don't know, and um, what, what I do think is that direct relation between uh, vegetative and generative, there is, like I mentioned, in the temperature, we have a very high temperature, and generally it's going in, in a generative direction, but further, I, I don't know. Yeah, yeah. Yes? Then go on to the next presentation, or do we have a small? Yeah. Thanks very much, Klaus. Um, I've just had some feedback from our uh, online audience that we're just having some trouble uh, hearing the questions from the audience. So from now on, I'll, I'll try to jump in and paraphrase as well, and um, just so we can make that a bit clear for the, the listeners online. Um, are there any any other questions that? we can cover or we'll move on to the next presentation online questions. or online questions please please send them through I don't have any okay all right um, we will keep going but uh, please send your questions through and um, we'll, we'll get class to to answer them for you um, wonderful all right, thank you, and uh, we'll uh, start the, the next session with class. Hmm. Yeah, strawberry is always a challenge, and it remains a challenge. A lovely challenge. Um, some tendencies in strawberries. This is from a German uh, newspaper, uh, a woman, a glossary, how do you call it? Woman Weekly or something like that. And Erdbeeren um, gesund für innen und außen. And that means uh, strawberries healthy for inside and outside. And then they're focusing how healthy strawberries are generally very low energy antioxidants, vitamins inside. Beautiful. Health benefits of strawberries, now you can read it yourself, boost immune system, reduces risk of eye-related ailments, helps maintain normal blood pressure, risk of arthritis, gout and cancer, a nervous system, heart diseases, cholesterol, almost medicines, or better even, they taste good. And this is strange. Uh, this, this is a kind of product that seems to have Wi-Fi energy, solar powered, and it's related to strawberry. Oh, it isn't. It's not on here. It, it, if I, it, it, it has a name related to strawberry. I just forgotten by now. I thought it was here on top, but uh, 
So that means that also for other things in, in, in life, strawberry is used for a good marketing of products. What we see here, I like uh, music, but relate the direct relation between music and strawberries, it might be also a marketing item. Here again, 25 best benefits of strawberry for hair and health. Wow. Isn't she beautiful? I'd love to eat it this way. And this is strawberry. This is you strawberry growing. Excellent. The most, the best product in the market, I think. If you are doing marketing, easy. Just go on and it looks great. And then the taste, if you see it, I like a picture. It's not mine. I took it somewhere from the internet. And then, it's not only nice. Germany, the government has an organization to check for food safety. And this is a report from 2018. 120 chemicals found in strawberries. You can see here, this is the active substance, Wirkstoff in Deutschland, in German. Here's the number, the samples, without residue, with residue. So that means from 771 samples, you have 423 with cipro ciprodinyl, fludioxonyl, 759 samples, 416 with fludioxonyl, Germany, fluopiram, and so on. I can go on. It goes way down be below the desk to the floor somewhere of this, this list. Strawberries in Germany. This is the United States. Dirty dozen. If you love to eat strawberries, apples, tomatoes, or celery, you may want to go organic. The 2018 Dirty Dozen list has been released by the Environmental Working Group, and the results aren't too tasty. Produce with a thin outer layer tends to contain more pesticide residue than produce with a hard outer layer. At the top of the list for the third year in a row are strawberries. A third of all samples contain 10 or more pesticides, with one sample alone containing 22 separate pesticide residues. Spinach comes in at number two, with 97% of samples containing pesticide residue. Nearly 94% of all tested nectarines contain two or more pesticides. Quite shocking, isn't it? After the beautiful strawberries. There was the United States. A Dutch newspaper, a large Dutch newspaper, they're talking about the MRL of uh, imidacloprid. MRL is a known uh, term. Maximum residue level, imidacloprid. In baby food, only 0.01 milligram per kilo is allowed. In surface water, this amount, 0. Point and so on, 83 milligram. Difference. Baby food may contain 1,200 times more. It's an interesting. And then the conclusion of a newspaper, the Dutch systems, the EU systems models are not safe. Now this is about stapling of um, residues and effect on health within the same group, for example. Extra restriction supermarkets in Germany little there is uh, in, in in the EU you may have 120 of chemicals in your strawberries but it's important that they all below the maximum re residue level and supermarket change in Germany said from look here this is not what our consumers want we go down and from now on you're allowed to have only in the little for example five residues and those residues are not allowed to have the normal legal amount of uh, MRL inside, but only 30% of this MRL. And the total residue is not allowed to be five times 100, 500%. The total residue may be only 80% of the MRL. So they go much, they're much stricter as the law in Germany. And it's the same for the Aldi, Edeka and the Klobus. What a focus. Here's my grandson eating strawberries. How would I like to have a strawberry? I can't handle it if a strawberry has plant protection or residues inside. 
and I see us, my grandson or other children or old people, sick people who used to eat a lot of strawberry, they're getting strawberries with residues. I can't handle it. And I'm very happy, a lot of growers with me. I see more and more growers that say, no, this is not the way I want to grow strawberries. I want to have strawberries that are free, that are really healthy. It doesn't matter, and that's a little bit another discussion. Um, if we see uh, the residues in vegetables and so on, and we compare it with not eating vegetables and fruit, that's much worse as eating those vegetables and fruit. That's, I'm 100% sure about it. I'm also eating a lot of vegetables, a lot of fruit, and I am aware that I'm also getting residue, but without eating those, I would be more sensitive for illness and so on. So it's just healthy and go on with eating those things. You can't live on water alone. And even then there's a question whether it's clean. And the environment, isn't she beauty there? Beautiful? Lace wing, huh? Changes over time, it's about IPM. As I started with uh, strawberries, and we were looking for some other possibilities, uh, predators and so on, then just search your search for a predator that might switch my pest management, or in the best case, integrated pest management. So you had a problem with spider mites, for example, you had a list, and look, for, hmm, maybe I should use that one because it's not so sensitive for my plant protection. But it didn't work quite well often populations of predators went down and problems with spider mites went up. Pests and predators, so more focus on your pests you have and, and, and the predators that could be able and first focus on those one and then search for IPM. So first have a look on what pests do we have, what predators am I going to use and then for IPM. So what what uh, plant protection, what, what chemical might switch next to, to those, uh, those uh, predators I have, for example, and I could treat them also a little bit, I could also treat a little bit my, uh, my, my pests. And by now, um, we're not just looking on those things, it's going much further because uh, I want an optimum climate, I want optimum circumstances for my uh, predators to develop, to develop and go down. It's a very nice example. I'm all, always wondered at the beginning. We have a garden, uh, just a normal garden, uh, and several uh, raspberry uh, canes in the garden, in a flower garden. And interesting was, in case you have uh, raspberries outside in production, for example, and you don't do anything on it, spider mites may become a big issue. Generally, there are a lot, at least in the Netherlands and Germany where I'm going. And in those uh, raspberry canes in the flowers, uh, between the flowers, we never had any, any spider mites or no problem with spiders, I better say it that way. Never had any problems with it, so we didn't have to do anything on it. And that's what I mean with uh, focus on the climate, on the circumstances of growing for the pr predators. There's much to do on that, that, uh, that, that item. I will give you some uh, examples. Yeah, first this way. Here, for example, first go a little bit into this and then I'll come back on, uh, on, on climate. This is a leaf with aphids. Now, what would you say? It's good or not good? I see people thinking, no, it's not good. Someone another other opinion? You like it this way? No, here not. Everything agrees on you, should, you, should, you shouldn't have this, this amount of... Yes, you, you're, you're right on some, some level. Here I focus a little bit more on what do we see in here. Here I see aphids, 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 everywhere aphids. But this one, and that one, and that one, these are very big. And they are already... Um, there's a, the aphidius is a predator, it's a very small fly, lays its eggs in those aphids, and then it's after some time it comes out. I can't show it here. Later on in the presentation I have a nice picture of it. And it comes out and then it makes a small hole and then the fly, fly comes out and it lays about 300 eggs so it's qu going quite fast and then also those other aphids may, may be killed in this way. 
So if I see this picture, you may expect that in case the temperatures and the circumstances are good, within two, three weeks, all the aphids on there are um, infected, or how do you call it? There's an egg laid inside, so within three, four weeks they're killed. No problem at all. I go on with uh, spider mites. Now here you see several spider mites. Oh yeah, I just go back to the previous. What's interested in the... Uh, I also have growers with about uh, 300 tunnels, of, uh, a grower in Poland, and we always had a problem with managing uh, the balance between predators and, uh, and, and pests. Now, therefore, we have developed a system, a, a kind of ranking system also, to make it easier to, to, to say what's going on there. If I'm visiting there by now, and we see, for example, aphids, or let's say the next one, the spider mites, we're just checking from uh, what stage is it, or, or how many are there, and I made a ranking from zero till five. Three is the limit. In case you get more than three, you have to take action. Zero is just zero, and one is you see every now and then you see a, a spider mite or an aphid or a pest. Two, there are more. It's getting closer to the three level. Four is, is a lot, and five, then you fool with, with, with pests, so you have a problem. So we do this for the, the pests, for the spider mites. I take the, uh, the, the adults, I take the larva, and I take the eggs. So you can see how is the population build up. The same I do for uh, the predator mites. And the predator mites you, you, you can recognize. And generally they're moving very fast. They have another shape in case you have a, a magnifier, then you, you can see it quite easy. You, they are moving quite fast, have another shape, and the eggs are uh, from shape are almost like a chicken egg, but smaller, of course. And um, the, the, the eggs of a spider mite, they are just like a, a ball, a football, and you totally like glass. So it's quite easy to see the difference between a predator mite egg and a spider mite egg. So just write it down all in this scale. And what you can see, in, in case you start, for example, in the spring, and you have um, those red spider mite eggs on level two, and they are going to lay eggs, oh, that's going up, maybe level two or three. But if you see in the meantime also uh, predatory mites coming up there, so first on level one, and then you see them going up to level two, and you see several eggs. So there is a certain balance in the uh, pests, and the predators. In case you see it, I don't do anything. It's, I'm fine with it. Just let it go, and then the predators will solve this problem. But if you see uh, uh, that, that the predators are going down, so the number, in, I'm coming there every th two weeks, at the beginning there were level two, and level two, and level one, for example, and no new eggs of the predators, whereas the spider mites are going up, one, two, three, four, then you have to take action then you're already, already, already late for bringing in other predators, but there are some chemicals that are uh, what you are able to use in combination with, uh, with, with uh, predators also. So you need to make a correction. But generally, I, I used to make an action earlier. So uh, if you see the uh, low predators and the spider mites are going up, you, you can buy some commercial predators, bring them out, so they will solve this problem. So uh, that's quite clear, this system. And the same I do for uh, aphids, for example, and for uh, trips as well. You know one? You know this one? Ever seen before? What would you do? Spray? Other action? I asked it last time also, uh, also in, the, in, in the conference, and then people say, yes, we have to do immediately what. But interesting is this is a natural, this is the um, uh, Trips Aeolus. And the Aeolus, it has these white spots on the, on the back, this one. It's a predatory Trips, and it can eat quite a lot of other Trips. And in case we're going to spray against it, then the, the predatory Trips will be killed much, much easier as a, as a standard Trips, as a Trips Dabasi or... Uh, Californian western flower trips, for example. So then we have even a bigger problem. So if we spray, then I don't have predators anymore. My trips always survives on some level, and they can grow as, just as I want to. Um, in Poland, again, I had a grower where every 
last uh, end of the summer, they, they see a lot of uh, trips flying in and always together with these trips ALOs. And they don't do anything. And after a week or two, three, four, they just disappear and it's done without damage. Although the number of trips is sometimes quite a, quite a lot. And we're just talking about circumstances that it's important to see the whole crop. So not just focus on that strawberry and that one, one pest and so on. Is this what, this what I want? Do I want to have this crop? these circumstances in my clean house, clean house, clean house, greenhouse, <laughs> <clears throat> or this. This is in Hungary. It's, I, I, I love to see those growers. It's really a top grower, really. He's the top of the Hungarian growers growing in the soil. It's beautiful. It's cleaner in a greenhouse or sometimes by us at home. <laughs> it's unbelievable if you see what they are doing there. But is this really an optimum climate, optimum circumstances for predators? No. A predator needs to have higher humidity. I think it's the, here you can see a completely different system. A predator needs to have a higher humidity. It needs to have a place where he can hide or, or feed. Or, and here, for example, you see a, a tunnel with grass below it. And I've seen a lot of growers already that uh, started up their company and they just had a meadow and put in the poles for tabletops and afterwards the cutters and so on and start growing. And especially if it was a little bit too, too wet, this meadow, then you see a lot of predatory, natural predatory mites coming up. And, and uh, I've, I've seen it before that there were sometimes quite some, uh, some spider mites, but with the natural, natural Predators, they were able to, uh, to, to keep them in balance, so without any damage. And also, uh, you see, you see um, those flies coming up, the hoover fly and uh, the other one, the lace wing, for example, in th those circumstances. And in case you have a clean, clean crop like just before, although it looks nice, or here it looks nice, you won't have this uh, balance in your crop. This, those uh, predators don't have a place to go to. Do they have a separate irrigation just for the, the understory for the plants under the Yeah, that's the next step. There are already uh, growers that have a, a separate irrigation for under uh, under the gutters. Yes, in this uh, this grower, this is a German grower. Now I see this is a German grower. This is a heating pipe there below. You, you see it in here. This is for heating. And this is for the drip irrigation, and this is for uh, truss support. But she also, uh, this is a German uh, uh, grower, and she also hates to uh, to use chemicals. So it's practically no, no. It was last year totally without chemicals, only potassium uh, bicarbonate for uh, mildew, but for the rest, uh, nothing. And it, it works. It works. It's it's really nice to see. It's also a nice one, isn't it? <laughs> Naturally. Here you also see the grass below. And he, oh yeah, here's the, the predators. Against spider mites, he needs uh, about 60-70% uh, re relative humidity at least. So more as higher as 60-70% uh, in case you want, you want to use predators moderate warm temperatures and hoverfly and lace wings, flowers and sugars. In case you have some, some aphids in the area around and they are producing the sugars, it dro just drops down. It attracts hoverflies and lace wings already. And they have uh, a much higher, uh, they, they are laying much more eggs in case they have uh, higher levels of sugars in the area. Now here you see, um, this is my, from my, uh, my son. He had organic production of strawberry and two different system here with the wheat mat, you call it if I remember, the wheat mat between the rows and here with a mixture of grass and clover between the rows. And it was interesting to see the development of uh, predators also last season, that in these areas, especially as it got a little bit warmer in the summer, the, the predators really had a problem to remain there. And we had problems with trips and, 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 and uh, spider mites in there. Whereas in these, this region, 
the, where, the, where we had a grass and a clover between, no problem at all. You could just see that the climate is much better in there and the predators established very, very well. But also for the strawberries, we had a really hot summer. We have reached the 40 degrees this year, and what, what, what has never happened before, 40 degrees in the Netherlands, it's unbelievable. But um, in this part, uh, probably uh, the strawberries really suffered uh, the quality. Uh, they had a really problem with uh, soft and even some burning, whereas I don't say we didn't have it in this region. There was also some, but uh, far away, not, not, not that much as the other place. Here you see it a little bit closer. Here you see the strawberry, and here the grass and wheat even here, some clover in between. Organic. And it tastes unbelievable good. Yes, here I have a question, I see. Yeah, so the question is, um, uh, in the covered cropping system, do they bring in uh, pollinators also? So, uh, yeah, are they relying on bringing in bumblebees or honeybees or uh, growers um, planting or leaving habitat for pollinators, flowers? Yeah, so it's, it's uh, the habitat or, or also bringing in uh, bumblebees and uh, honeybees. Now, in generally, uh, especially in a spring period, as it's still cold, honeybees don't fly that much, and other insects are, are still very low in population, so they bring in bumblebees. So um, if I very remember by head, uh, bumblebees start, f start uh, working already from 4 or 5 degrees Celsius, whereas uh, bum honeybees start from about 12 degrees uh, Celsius. So that's quite a difference. And in case you have flowers, you, you would need some, uh, some, some pollination. So that's uh, why, why they bring in uh, bumblebees. And uh, the, uh, later in the year, it depends also on, 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 on the location. There are locations where they have quite a lot of natural pollinators. But if not, then they all or place uh, bumblebees or uh, honeybees. Yes, I see another question. With the uh, strawberries, are they keeping the crowds for two years, generally overseas, or are they for one season and then they're pulling them out and replanting for the next season? And the effect that that would have on obviously predators, because if it's disturbing the ground and mm. with tractors and machinery, So the question is, um, if I'm uh, plowing after after my strawberry cut, I'm plowing the ground to take out of the plastic, I'm pl plowing my ground, and the predators are inside, um, do they remain or do I uh, have to put news in? in? Um, what I've seen until now that they seem to adapt quite 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 easily uh, to that. So uh, I see them coming back. For example, the I will go back to the German. Um, Grower here, no, this one not. Uh, it's a little bit further. This is the German grower. She she's put, she's plowed it all, and uh, seeded in the the grasses. But there were a lot of uh, naturally uh, predators inside. It it seems that it's for the predators not a, not a big issue. But I've never counted how many losses we have because maybe hard or so. But it, they come back quite easily. And what's also interesting in this whole thing is um, naturally uh, or uh, own predators or commercial predators. I see, for example, an, 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 an Amblyseus andersoni, what that is in the Netherlands, in, in, German, in Western Europe, it's quite a normal um, uh, predator for spider mites and some level also for trips. Uh, it starts already working from 4.5 degrees, so that means even before the, the, the spider mite is active, it starts already searching for spider mites, eating spider mites and so on. But, but in the early spring, it can do really a great job, whereas uh, commercial predators in general start working from about 10, 12 degrees. So that, that makes, that, that makes quite, uh, quite big sense in the strawberry growing. In tomato growing, sweet pepper and so on, the t optimum temperatures are different, so it's there, there it may be not, uh, not really an, uh, an option, but in the strawberries, we, 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 I just like the naturally 
uh, nature um, uh, predators. And also here I've also mentioned it on the conference, for example, in case in every country I have seen predators that are available in the, in, in, uh, on, on, on the grass and so on. Normally if I'm outside, I'm, I'm, I'm doing my job and, uh, and, and uh, for example, at 10 or 12 o'clock I'm sitting down and have some bread somewhere outside. I take my loop and have a look what's going on there on the grasses. And then you see, uh, sometimes you see spider mites, sometimes you see predators running all around. So there are, uh, it doesn't matter how hot or how extreme a, t uh, a climate is, there are always pred predators that, that, that fit in that climate. And I think it's also very good for here Tasmania. I'm sure there are here also predators outside. Just find them and, and search for a way how, how you can use them and stimulate them and help them to be active in your crop. Or maybe you talked yesterday about it. I think uh, you have a university in here. Maybe there is someone who could, could find for a, uh, look for a possibility how to propagate those uh, natural av available predators in order to, to, to share them with the growers, for example. That would be a great thing, a really a great thing. And you as a university have normally might have the facilities there for. And it's the same with bumblebees. I understood there are no bumblebees maybe are allowed to bring in here to Tasmania. I've seen flying a bumblebee here in Tasmania. There must be possibilities to, to propagate them or so or to stimulate. Yes, I see a question. Okay, so I understand from the uh, remark that it's not allowed to propagate bumblebees that are naturally available. Okay, unfortunately. <laughs> we wish it were so. Yeah, wish, we wish it were so was the remark. Um, this one, this one, this one. Oh yeah, the, 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 other, uh, the other thing is uh, flower flowers to see that flowers uh, between or around strawberries what we have seen um, there has been done some research by university wageningen and, and other organizations from what will happen in case we we seed out flowers uh, or uh, make a make a, a place where um, uh, predators feel it feel themselves fine especially against aphids and trips for example and we've done it also last year uh, with a grower uh, we started and also my son also did and uh, then you could get those pictures and it was already for, for cons because he's selling the, the strawberries uh, at home and there were a lot of uh, consumers passing by or clients passing by, wow, that looks great, making pictures and so on. So it also gives an, 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 uh, an extra impulse to the marketing of his strawberries. And then you see those things, for example, aphids quite a lot in, 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 in the flowers. Um, oh, this is the home. Hoverfly. Isn't she beautiful? Oh, go big. Going too fast. But um, what we've really experienced until now is that you do see a lot of hoverflies. You see, you do see a lot of lace wings around those uh, those those flowers, and really a lot. And also, the pressure of aphids is going down quite strong. So you, what what we see is that the, the hoverflies and the lace wings don't only stay there in the flowers; they also fly out to the strawberries, uh, searching for prey around there. And, and going there, but what's, what was even more interesting that at the grower where we tried this out, he had quite some problems in one bed with flowers, he had quite some problems with wheat, and then the seed company advised him just cut it back and then it will come up again and the flowers develop faster as the weeds that were in there. So he did it, but then a day afterwards, or maybe even that afternoon, he called me, or the evening, he called me, look here, I have horrible amounts of trips in my strawberries, what shall I do? But he also found quite a lot of uh, Oreos. So we just talked about a balance between uh, the pest and the predator. And we say now the amount of Oreos might be enough for, for uh, preventing damage in the strawberry. So he decided not to spray anything. And he just left it that way and he didn't have any problem. But the interesting thing for me is that 
we we wanted to have these flowers as a kind of buffer for uh, for the for the pests and the predators, and it seems to work. There were a lot of trips in there, but the trips were kept in balance with the audience that we had in, in those flowers. Because about five meters from these flowers, his strawberries were, and they didn't, he didn't have any problems with trips in his strawberries. But well, that was really, really an, an interesting step forward, I think, also in, uh, in IPM in related to, to, to trips in, in, uh, in, in the strawberries. And it looks beautiful. All this hemming, if you dare, it's always. Um, now this is also to, to show what happens with several uh, chemicals. Here, uh, the Andri, uh, this is uh, predatory mites against trips. Aphidius colomani is, is against aphids, it's a small fly. Aphidius erifi is also against aphids. Uh, Aphidolatus is a very small fly that um, the, the, the problem with the aphidious type is in case you, you have a lot of, uh, in case you're going for uh, uh, organic or biological growing, for example, or no spraying, you may have a lot of spiders in your, uh, in your crop. They're developing very fast. In case you put out aphidious, they're caught by the spider webs and they're just gone. You, you can't handle them, the, aph uh, the aphids anymore. But this aphidolatus needs spider webs for its development, so it's not a problem. So you can put out a a few later, in case you have a lot of spiders, and they will handle the the. Uh, it also. This is the uh, lace wing. It's also Fertiella. This is against um, uh, spider mites. Neosaurus, and this is against. If I, I'm a little bit worried, but I've I've already meant the trips. But what I wanted to say is here you see quite a big difference in sensitivity for um, uh, plant protection. Calypso, Floramide bifenazate. Floramide bifenazate is normally uh, a, a chemical you can combine quite well with um, with pest with pests. So in case you have spider mites, you have predators inside, and for one for a reason. It do, does develop, so there are too many spider mites. You can use a fluoromite for correction. On the other way, in case you use Karatozeum, now here you see it, 8 till 12 weeks. That means after 8 till 12 weeks, it still will kill your predatory mites and so on. And that I've seen it also in case people take out the pyrethroids from the plant protection, the situation with predators is getting much, much better in that area. So. In generally, I advise the growers not to use spiritreats at all, because it kills the predators quite strong, very strong. And this, uh, I should have mentioned it, a one you can see on a color already is no problem at all. A two is a little problem, a three, they have percentages, uh, killing of uh, one is uh, zero to 25 percent loss, a two is 25 to 50 percent loss, a three is uh, 50 to 75 percent loss, and four is 75 to 100 percent loss. So you can see quite easy uh, how many uh, loss may occur in, in case you spray with a certain chemical. You can find normally you can find those on the suppliers of the of the predators. Ah, oh yeah, here you have the this aphid, very big, and it didn't come out yet. But you can normally also here here or here on the back you see a little bit little hole manhole, uh, I think, where the fly uh, got out and then he starts flying and lay in it, laying its eggs. Or there's also a type, but then you have a little bit white uh, stuff here on the bottom and it comes out from the bottom of the, the aphid. And that's what I'm looking so for, also for. So in case you have the, the balance I just talked about, pred predators and pests, in case you see aphids, but you also see predated uh, aphids and you see flying around those aphidias, for example, you can, uh, you, you can count them in, 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 in making decisions of if you need to spray or not. And what might be good to know, um, the threshold for uh, damage of aphids in strawberries is quite high. So you can accept much more uh, aphids in your strawberries as you would love to. An and, uh, econ economical uh, damage doesn't occur so very fast because of the energy they take out of the plants. The only thing is that you may have this, uh, this sugar falling down and then you get uh, the, this, this black uh, mold on your strawberries. That, that, that's an item. 
but because of taking out sugars of the plant, it's, it's hardly hardly of any effects in in, in the strawberries. It's also done also research done in, in, in sweet pepper. They've they've uh, proven that so that that might be an interesting thing to know. This is the larva of a of a hoverfly. It's on a big screen. It's not so easy to see, but but it's a beauty. It's a beauty if if you see them on the on the, on the loop. And here you have the lace wing. Also beautiful. And in case you see those wings and uh, the shapes and the color, the red eyes, it's it's really unbelievable. And then the larva is is a very aggressive one. So eating, especially in population of uh, populations of aphids, you will see them, and it's, it, they are eating a lot. And this is the loop I normally use for uh, identifying the... I, there I also have one on the table. Strawberries. Questions? Do you have questions? Yeah. I was, um, I was wondering if any of the growers that you work with in Europe have been experimenting with um, plant growth promoting bacteria or fungi, either just um, to enhance plant health or as a preventative measure. Yeah, so, uh, if I well understand, is is there any grower I'm working with uh, that has used uh, bacteria or uh, microorganisms to stimulate plant health, or uh, yeah, as, a as a preventative measure? Um, yes, um, the, the company I just mentioned uh, of uh, one of yeah, you've seen the table with the, with the sensitivity of. Uh, uh, Predators for different uh, chemicals. Now, this company, Coppet, is also dealing with um, with uh, microorganisms for stimulating uh, plant health. For example, also in the rooting zone, especially they have the um, trigoderma type, and there are several more. Um, the trigoderma type against uh, Phytophthora and Verticillium, if I well remember, uh, they they are used, um, but they also try to go further in that and. For me, it's it's a little bit a question in 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 what sense, in, in, in what level it makes sense because what what you see until now that uh, for uh, a good growth of those micro elements elements in a root zone it, and then I don't talk about the trigoderma but or, for, about the other ones you need a quite low uh, fertilization level so instead of a normal uh, 11 to 13 uh, millimole of uh, nitrate for example you should go to you should go down to four or five. And at this moment, we're just um, uh, thinking, uh, just evaluating: from, is it possible, really, to, to go down that far? And will or will it bother uh, plant development too much, so uh, to 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 have still a good yield? So uh, there are growers trying at it; they're also doing re research on it. But I would like to have uh, more uh, hard numbers on it. To, to, to give a, a good advice, I'm, I'm, I hope I hope we will we, we will be able to uh, to improve plant health in that way. I, it, it would be a, a system I love, but at this moment I'm a little bit hesitating uh, if we can reach the same yield with with, uh, with those uh, optimum for the microorganism optimum growing circumstances. Yeah. Other questions. Yes, please. Well, a, a general question, please. How do growers, particularly deal with nitrogen, how do they you know, monitor what's not used? What do they do with it? How does the government um, get checks on that? Hmm. Uh, the question is here from uh, how do uh, growers monitor nitrogen and especially the part of the nitrogen that is not used so in drain water for example I understand and uh, what, what are the government uh, regulations on that. Now we see um, the EU, EU regulations because it's more and more becoming EU by now instead of uh, national government. EU regulations on that are getting more and more severe. Um, especially in Belgium, they are quite strict on it, and that means from uh, no um, pollution from uh, fertilization in the surface water, and that also re re resulted in in, uh, in in several uh, mechanical or other uh, ways we have to treat our our water before or um, 
uh, draining or, or, or how do you call it, releasing it on the surface water, or better, we're re reusing the, 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 the water we have. So reuse of drain water, so we don't have to, uh, to, to flush it or to, to throw it away, how do you call it? In a so at, at this moment, there are several ways of, of doing that. Because the, the, the problem with drain water always, the two problems, the one is diseases and the other one is uh, um, elements, how do you call it, uh, if they're getting more, more and more and more elements in, 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 in the drain water. So it's getting higher and higher, accumulating, of um, uh, fertilizer accumulating in, the, in, 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 in your system. So with the health, there are several options with uh, UV, for example, or a com combination of using UV light with uh, peroxide. Or uh, a very interesting, what I like at least very much, is a slow scent filter uh, with what you you need uh, only coarse, quite coarse scent. You need drains and certain amount, so it doesn't go to a certain area, so it doesn't go that fast. And then you, you can use that, and then it's going down. You can reuse your water, so that means also the the value, the the, the, the important um, uh, fertilizers that are still in the water, you can calcu calculate it. So you don't have to give it, so it also makes your uh, fertilization a little bit cheaper. Uh, was that, that that was the answer, or? Yes, it is. <coughs> the government can check on individual farms, or is it? Yeah, yeah, they are. They are. It's a, a part of the government. They are involved in that. It's or uh, the community, or uh, we have an organisation that's responsible for surface water, or they are checking it and have a look on the farms. What's going on there? Uh, is it allowed or not? Yes. And before, before, um, it, and this this is not only related to fertilization, but also to uh, chemicals that may be found in in drain water, for example. In case people spray them, it may it may also be found in drain water. So before it it, it would be uh, released, or how do you call it, to the surface water, it needs to be 100% clean. And there are certain possibilities for it to do that. <coughs> 